Well, we talked about last week with white dwarfs. This is blast in my ears. Okay. When we talked last week about white dwarfs, that stuff is really hard. Okay. And none of you are really mad at me for that, so I guess that's a good thing. Okay. What we're going to talk about today is a different way of learning about the age of the universe, an independent method that's going to come up with the same answer, which is reassuring, uh, at least for us scientists who think that different methods that come up with the same answer provide you some confidence that you're probably doing something right. So are we ready to go? All right. So could we bring the lights down again, John? The most important concept that we talked about last week is what I've got up on the screen right now. The idea that for stars, mass matters. And hopefully you remember why it is that mass matters for stars, but we will come back to that and remind ourselves of, as to why that's the case. What must be true for every main sequence star with a mass of the sun that has ever existed at any time anywhere in the universe. Here's our HR diagram. I told you this is the most important diagram in astrophysics. You're going to see it lots and lots and lots of times. And I have a pointer right here. Don't know where anything is. So here's our, whoa, we didn't want to do that. All right, I don't have a pointer. I have a clicker. That's the problem, OK? So I'll be careful. Okay. Here's our HR diagram. We have a vertical axis, which is the luminosity of the stars, how bright the stars are. The horizontal axis is the temperature of the stars. What must be true, the sun is, is marked in the middle there of what we call the main sequence. What must be true of every main sequence star that has ever existed anywhere in the universe at any time in the history of the universe. They will die. That's, a, that's not going to be on my slide, but that's a true point. Okay? And it's an important point. It's actually the critical point for all of today. Okay? But that's a step ahead. What else must be true about every star like the sun, every star with the same mass as the sun that has ever existed? The energy that it gives off is what? The brightness is the same. The brightness of every one of those stars must be the same. What else? The temperature must be the same. Why? Why must the temperature and brightness of every star that has the same mass of the sun that has ever existed or ever will exist anywhere in the history of the universe at any time why must they all have the same temperature? Same mass. Mass matters. Right? The mass matters. So same luminosity, same temperature. Because they have the same mass, they have the same gravitational strength, which squeezes the star. And gravity will never give up. So something has to push back against gravity to keep that star from just squeezing itself into nothingness. As the star squeezes itself, as its own gravity squeezes itself, it gets hotter inside. As it gets hotter inside, the heat pushes back. If it's not hot enough to stop gravity from squeezing it, gravity squeezes it some more, and it gets hotter. And if it's not hot enough, gravity squeezes it some more. Eventually, gravity squeezes it so hard that nuclear fusion reactions set in in the core. Those are the reactions in which protons collide with each other to form heavier elements. That releases energy. That's a new energy source for the star. That will release enough energy to stop gravity. And if the fusion reactions don't go fast enough to produce enough heat to stop gravity from squeezing the star some more, gravity will squeeze the star some more. So the star will get hotter, so the fusion reactions will go faster, so the star will release more heat at the center, which will produce more thermal pressure pushing outwards, which will eventually that's not me, which will eventually stop gravity. Once the star comes into balance, once it's hot enough in the center to generate enough fusion reactions 
quickly enough to generate enough heat to resist gravity. It has a certain temperature and a certain luminosity, and it stays with exactly those temperatures and luminosities. If it cools down, it squeezes itself, it gets hotter, it pushes back, it expands, it comes back to this equilibrium state. The main sequence are the equilibrium states for stars of lots and lots of different masses. The most massive stars are more luminous and hotter. The lower mass stars are less luminous and cooler. So there are numbers marked on this plot at the bottom right. It says 0.1 M sun, 10% of the mass of the sun. Those are the stars at the bottom of the main sequence. At the very top, it says 30 and 60 times the mass of the sun. The most massive stars are 50 or 60 times more massive than the sun. And the sun's right in the middle. The main sequence is the locus on this plot of stars that are stable. Gravity can't squeeze them any tighter because they're hot enough inside to resist gravity. That's the key to our main sequence. Okay? So every star like the sun that has ever existed anywhere in the universe, any time in the history of the universe, will land at the same spot on the main sequence. That's the physics of stars. They can't help it. Yes, sir? If it is, let's be careful with the word bigger. Okay. Let's be careful with the word bigger. On the chart, what we've marked are the masses of the stars. So that's how much stuff they're made of. That controls their internal gravitational strength. That will determine how hard they squeeze themselves, which will determine how hot they have to be to come into balance. The temperature that keeps them in balance is going to determine the physical size of the star, how big or small it is. So the actual radius or diameter of a star is determined by its mass. More massive stars, which we could say are bigger stars, will be physically bigger stars. Remember when we looked on this HR diagram originally, we said, well, the bottom left were the little stars, the top right are the big stars. As you go from bottom left to top right, the stars get bigger. But we also said, I was told not to get too close to this side of the room with the microphone. Okay. We also said if we have two stars, one down here and one up top, same temperature, but different brightnesses, then the one at the top must be bigger. So the stars on the top left of the HR diagram are bigger than the stars on the bottom right. The physical size of the star is determined by the mass. The radius, the temperature, the luminosity, you name it. Pick any parameter you want about a star. It's determined by the mass of the star. The it's mass not, is what makes everything happen. It's not constant, though, because they're giving off energy, which would be mass. Okay. The, the question was, the mass isn't constant because the star is giving off light, and light is energy, and energy equals mc squared. Energy is mass. So the star is losing mass as it shines, as it ages. That's certainly true. Its mass doesn't change much. Over the entire lifetime of the star, the mass of the star will change by much less than 1%. And that's not going to move it much on the HR diagram. But as stars age, they will move a little bit. So this thing we call the main sequence is not infinitely thin. It's not an infinitely thin line. It's got some thickness. And the stars are actually born on the bottom side of that line. And as they age, they move upwards to the, the right side of that line. And that is for some of the reasons that we just talked about. But the mass of the star determines everything about the star. Everything. This is an HR diagram we've seen before. These are all of the stars that were measured by the Hipparchos satellite that was in space in the 1990s. All of these stars have measured temperatures. They have measured apparent brightnesses, because we look out at stars and we measure how bright they look. A bright-looking star might be a super bright star that's far away, or it might be a very faint star 
it's very close. So first we measure the temperatures of the stars and how bright they look. What else do we have to measure in order to put them on the HR diagram? Distance. Distance. That's right. If we measure the distance, then I know whether I'm looking at a bright star that's far away or a faint star that's close. Once I know the distance, instead of worrying about apparent brightness, I know the absolute or the intrinsic brightness of the star, which is determined by the mass. So I need to measure distances. Hipparchus's job was to measure distances of stars. And there are about 20,000 stars plotted on this diagram. Those are the stars closest to the sun for which we can measure the distances. And therefore, we measure their true luminosities and their true temperatures. And when we put all of those stars on the diagram, they're just random stars in space. They're the 20,000 closest stars to the sun. And when we do that, we get this amazing looking plot. It's not a scatter plot. Most of the stars fall on this thing we call the main sequence. There were a few stars on the bottom left. We know those are the white dwarfs. There are a few stars on the top right. Those are the red giants. But most of the stars are on the main sequence. All these are in the yes, all these stars are in this galaxy. Yeah, the, the, we can't directly measure the distance to stars in other galaxies. We're going to find other ways to measure distances to other galaxies. That's actually where we're headed today. Yes? Yeah, the stars are hotter at their cores than they are on their surfaces. So these temperatures are a measurement of the surface temperature of the star. It's the surface temperature of the star. This is not a scatter plot. The stars live in particular places. We now understand why they live in these particular places. This plot then tells us that 90% of all the stars randomly surveyed live on the main sequence. This is going to be really important for us because we know how stars behave. This is what stars should look like. There's this main sequence where most stars are. So now let's go somewhere else. I'm going to go back in time a little bit to understand something called star clusters. Okay. When the telescope was invented, every object in the sky was assumed to be a star, unless it was a planet. When Galileo first looked with the telescope, he saw some things that were fuzzy. And with the telescope, he could resolve some of those fuzzy things into individual stars. Those things are star clusters. And in the 17th century and then into the 18th century, astronomers actually were not interested in star clusters at all. But they were very interested in comets. And comets are fuzzy things in the sky. And when you look with a telescope, they don't resolve in, into individual stars. They stay fuzzy. But when you first look at them, you don't know if it's a comet or a star cluster. So one of the tasks astronomers set for themselves in the 18th century was to start identifying star clusters, because they don't move like comets. And if you go out tonight and you see a fuzzy thing and you know, oh, that's a star cluster, you know it's not a comet. If you see a fuzzy thing over there and no one's ever looked at that thing before, maybe it's a comet. So people wanted to catalog the fuzzy things. The first person who tried to do this is this guy, Lee Gentile who in 1749 found five so-called nebulous objects and cataloged them. I wanted to read a little bit about Le Gentile because uh, he was a, a hard-working astronomer. This illustrates just how tough the job of an astronomer is, which is an important thing for me to convince you of. Okay. <laughs> Le Gentile was asked in the late 17th century, 18th century, to sail to India to observe a transit of Venus, when the planet Venus went across the face of the sun. This was thought to be the best possible way to measure the distance to the sun. And this was an important number to know. Le Gentile sailed from France on March 26, 1760. I'm reading from a book called Coming of Age in the Milky Way by Timothy Ferris. This is a great book. It's about 20 years old, but it's a great book to read, very well written. He sailed from France on March 26, 1760, planning to observe the transit the following year from the east coast of India. 
Monsoons blew his ship off course, and transit day found him becalmed in the middle of the Indian Ocean, unable to make any useful observations. Determined to redeem the expedition by observing the second transit, because transits of Venus occur in pairs, about 10 years apart. Determined to redeem the expedition by observing the second transit, Le Gentil booked passage to India, built an observatory atop an obsolete powder magazine in Pondicherry, and waited. The sky remained marvelously clear through May, only to cloud over on June 4th, the morning of the transit, then clear again as soon as the transit was over. <laughs> Le Gentil wrote, I was more than two weeks in singular dejection and almost did not have the courage to take up my pen to continue my journal, and several times it fell from my hands when the moment came to report to France the fate of my operation. This is the fate which awaits astronomers. And that's true. People used to not want to go to the mountains with me when I had observing time because I brought the bad weather. <laughs> but worse things awaited Le Gentil. Stricken with dysentery, Le Gentil remained in India for another nine months, bedridden. He then booked passage home aboard a Spanish warship that was demasted in a hurricane off the Cape of Good Hope and blown off course north of the Azores before finally limping into port at Cadiz. Le Gentil crossed the Pyrenees and at last set foot on French soil after 11 years, 6 months, and 13 days of absence. Upon his return to Paris, he learned that he had been declared dead, his estate looted, and its remains divided up among his heirs and creditors. <laughs> he renounced astronomy, married, and retired to write his memoirs. <laughs> 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 this, this is a really tough business. I mean. All right. So, Le Gentil got us started trying to observe star clusters. Uh, the Frenchman Messier in 1701 created the most famous catalog of these clusters with 101 of these so-called nebulous objects. Uh, and John Herschel, not William Herschel, but William Herschel's son John in 1864 produced something called the General Catalog with 5,000 of these objects. This was then revised by Dreyer a couple decades later as the new general catalog with 13,000 of these objects. When you see an object that's called M15, it's the 15th object in Messier's catalog from 1781. If you see an object that's called NGC 1422, it's the 1422nd object in Dreyer's new general catalog. So by the end of the 19th century, astronomers had a vast catalog of these kinds of objects. So what are they? One kind of cluster is known as an open cluster. The Pleiades is one such open cluster. Open clusters typically have dozens or maybe a few hundred stars. They have irregular shapes like the Pleiades. You can see there's some fuzziness in the picture. That's not because your vision is bad. It's because there's some fuzziness in the picture. These stars are young stars. They're surrounded by some nebulosity, some gas and dust, which is being illuminated by the young stars. These are open clusters. Here's another open cluster, NGC. See, gotcha. NGC 265. They're beautiful things. But you can actually, if you really want to, you can count the stars. NGC 3293 on the top left, the jewel box on the right. M44, Messier's 44th object on the left, NGC 6791 on the right, open clusters. The other kind of star cluster is known as a globular cluster. They look like globs. Globular clusters typically have hundreds of thousands of stars. Not hundreds, but hundreds of thousands of stars. Because they have so many stars, they tend to be spherical in shape, not irregularly shaped. There's no gas or nebulosity in them. We think that's because they're older, and I'll make the case to you that they are older. This one is M80. Here are some others, M13 and M55 and 47 Tuck. 47 Tuck has an interesting name for a star cluster because the name 47 Tuck is a star name. And that's because when 47 Tuck got its name, it was the 47th brightest star in the constellation Tucane, or whatever that constellation is, it looks like a star unless you have a good telescope. With a good telescope, you see the structure to this thing. But it is so centrally condensed that without a good telescope, it looks like a star. So we have globular clusters and open clusters. What's the size of these things in relative? That's a good question. I don't have the answer on the tip of my tongue. 
10 to 100 light years. Okay? For something like the Pleiades, it might be four or six light years. For one of these, it's going to be bigger. But not, for me, that's small. <laughs> yes? Why doesn't gravity pull them all together? If the stars themselves were not moving, gravity would do that. Because gravity is an attractive force. All of them are attracting each other. So gravity should pull them together. But each star has some motion. This one's going that way, and this one's going that way, and this one's going this way. So what gravity does is it holds them together. But they're budging around like bees in a swarm. And if you could take away each of their individual velocities, it would collapse. The cluster would collapse. But because when the stars were born in the cluster, they were born with random motions, gravity can hold them together but can't pull them together. Yes? A cluster of stars is a group of stars that gravity has actually bound together. A constellation of stars are stars that are just off in the same direction. When you look in that direction, you see some stars. Some of those stars may be bright stars that are far away. Some may be faint stars that are close. They all look pretty bright. So you look at the Big Dipper, and you see those stars, and you say, oh, connect them all. But those stars have nothing to do with each other. They're just in the same direction, just as when I look out through the crowd here. No. I see people with different distances, but you guys are all in the same direction. So you all came from the same neighborhood, right? Okay. So a constellation is a random collection of stars that just happen to be in the same direction. And our eyes pick out the brightest ones, and we draw lines between them so we can make a map of the sky. No, they don't have to be in circular motion. Each of them will be in orbit around the gravitational center of the cluster. Right? Those orbits will be elliptical, not circular. But they all will be in orbit around the, the gravitational center. Yes, ma'am? Uh, not for us. Okay? I mean, comets, yes, they have significance. Comets are big chunks of ice that are in orbit around the sun. And they are pieces of material that are probably well preserved from the epoch when the sun and the planets were born. But that doesn't tell us anything about the history of the universe. It, they do tell us something about our solar system. Yes, sir? We know these are not galaxies because of where they are. When people first started discovering them in the 18th and 19th centuries, they didn't know that they weren't galaxies. They really didn't know what they were. It was only in the 1910s and 1920s that we figured out what the Milky Way was, that the Milky Way is a galaxy. These clusters of stars, all but one that I showed you, there was one that is identified. Where is my? This one is identified as being in the small Magellanic Cloud. That's in another galaxy. All of the others are physically in our galaxy. We know that by measuring the structure of our galaxy, how far away these clusters are, and putting together the big picture of the universe, which is what we're going to try to do. Yes? The gravitational force depends only on the masses of the two things that are pulling each other and how far apart they are. So if I take two pieces of mass and put them closer together, the gravitational force of attraction between them is stronger. If I make them further apart, they're weaker. But that's all that gravity depends on, the masses and the distances between them. So in a cluster like this, as the stars move, the distances between the stars all change. The masses of the stars don't change, but the relative distances do. So the relative force of attraction for any one star, you'd have to calculate the force of attraction between it and every other star in the cluster. And you can calculate that today, and that would determine which direction that star should move in. Now that that star's moved in that direction, its distance from all the other stars has changed. So you'd have to recalculate it if you wanted to know what was going to happen to it next year or the year after. 
but with these clusters, there are enough stars that, in effect, all these changes average out. But you could calculate it if you wanted to. Gravity is a 1 over r squared relationship, yes, inverse square law. Yes? We have not seen any stars collide. The distances between stars are actually fairly big compared to the stars themselves, even in these clusters. The sizes of galaxies are big compared to the distances between galaxies, and we actually see lots of galaxies colliding. But we don't see lots of stars colliding. However, most of us think that stars do collide in the cores of these dense clusters. And there's lots of evidence for mergers of stars in these clusters. But we haven't actually seen the collisions happen. If the sun were in the middle of a cluster, it would be a very different environment for us. We'd have light from all these other stars. While we wouldn't likely collide with another star, it's very likely that the stars in the cluster experience lots and lots of close passages near other stars. So you don't have to collide to have bad things happen. So if the sun came close enough to another star, let's say that the other star was at the distance of Neptune or Uranus or Pluto from the sun, all the planets orbiting the sun would be ripped out of orbit. So it would be hard for the stars that are at the center of these clusters to have stable planetary systems. Stars in the outskirts of these clusters are probably OK. Stars in open clusters like these are probably OK. But at the cores of these dense globular clusters, that would not be a good place to look for planets that might have life on them, because the planets would be very unstable in their orbits around those stars. <coughs> All right, we understand clusters. We've actually answered this. What holds a cluster together? Gravity. So what is going to determine whether a cluster survives for a long time as a cluster, or whether a cluster is dispersed over what, for me as an astronomer, is a fairly short amount of time, maybe just 100 million years? Okay. What is going to determine whether the clusters stay together or over some long amount of time fly apart? The mass. The mass of what? The cluster. If the cluster has an enormous number of stars, it's going to hold itself together. If the cluster has relatively few stars, it's going to disperse. The stars are going to pass by each other and get new velocities because in this close encounter, one star gets thrown forward uh, with a high velocity. It now has such a high velocity it escapes from the cluster. And now the cluster has less mass. And now two other stars in the cluster experience a close encounter, not necessarily a collision, but a close encounter which accelerates one of the stars and throws it out of the cluster. And now the cluster has less mass, and this cluster starts to expand. And over time, the cluster disperses. Open clusters are young, astronomically young, because they can't hold themselves together. Globular clusters are older, or at least can be older, because they can hold themselves together. Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, for a cluster like this, you can only do it for the stars that you can pick out individually. Okay. But you can detect, if you come back next year, it's going to look the same. But I can measure the red shifts and the blue shifts of the individual stars, which tells me their velocity is toward or away from us. Okay. For clusters that are closer, like the Pleiades, we can actually measure their motion toward or away from us, but we also measure the motion across the sky. So we can get their three-dimensional motion, which is exactly where we're going. Okay. So here is the Hyades cluster. The Hyades is an open star cluster. This map down here, the bottom right, should orient you. The Hyades is a bit up and to the right from the Orion constellation. If you use Orion's belt as a pointer, Orion's belt points directly toward Aldebaran. 
Aldebaran's a red giant. In this picture, you can actually see it looks red. Aldebaran is the eye of the bull, Taurus the bull. Now we're talking constellations. Aldebaran, however, is not part of the Hyades Cluster. It's at a very different distance than all of the other stars in the Hyades Cluster. But most of the stars in the center of this picture, all of them except the brightest one, are in the Hyades Cluster. If Look at the pictures of the cars first. Here we have a bunch of cars on a highway. All the lanes on the highway are the same width, and they're parallel. So you jump on Interstate 40, and there's a car next to you, and the two cars drive side by side from Knoxville to Nashville. They stay in their own lanes. They stay the same distance apart, all the way from one city to the next. No problem. But if you look at the lanes on a highway and watch the cars, and stand on an overpass and watch the cars in the distance, it looks like the cars are merging together. And you see that in these pictures. These parallel lines merge at great distances. This is an illusion, if you will, but it's how our eyesight responds to these things. A star cluster includes a bunch of stars which are bound together by gravity, but they're not just sitting there. That whole cluster is moving. The cluster might be orbiting the center of the galaxy, but all those stars in the cluster stay together as they orbit. In the Hyades Cluster, about 100 years ago, 101 years ago, actually, somebody realized that this method in which objects moving in parallel lines, all of them going in the same direction, appear to converge in the distance, could be used to measure the distance to the Hyades Cluster. It's called the convergent point method. The picture in the middle, the cartoon in the middle, has all those stars moving in parallel directions. The bottom left has what it will appear, those motions, how they will appear to us those stars will appear to be going toward the same point at a great distance. So these are the measurements, and you can't see a whole lot on here, but these are the measurements of the motions of the stars in the Hyades Cluster. And the dots are the stars in the cluster, and the little lines are the directions, the vectors, if you will, that point out the direction in which those stars are moving. The one on the left just has all those little motion vectors. The one on the right extends all those vectors to show where they're going. And the Hyades Cluster has a convergent point. All those stars appear to be heading toward that same point. They're not. They're all going in parallel lines, but they're going away from us. And because of that, they appear to be going toward the same point. The further away the cluster would be, the slower they'd appear to converge. A cluster that's close those angles would appear to converge very quickly. So we can actually measure the distance to the Hyades Cluster from this convergent point method. It's not accurate to 1%, but it's a good start. So the Hyades Cluster distance was first measured in 1910. That distance was found to be about 40 parsecs, which is about 127 light years. Astronomers talk in parsecs. You may think in neither unit, but you may have heard of light years more than parsecs. But the distance, about 127 light years to the Hyades Cluster. What that means, and someone asked earlier, how big is the cluster itself? It turns out the Hyades Cluster is about 10 parsecs across, from one end to the other. Which means the internal distances between the stars is much less than the distance to the cluster itself. So to an approximation, we can pretend that all the stars are at the same distance. That's a good starting point. It's not perfect, but it's a good starting point to estimate the distance to the cluster. And if we assume all the stars in the Hyades Cluster are at 40 parsecs, we'll get what we'll see in a minute, an HR diagram for the Hyades Cluster. But I have a question about the Hyades Cluster before we go on. Here's a list of nearby star clusters. What makes the Hyades so special? It's the closest. 
It's not just the closest. It's closest by quite a bit compared to most of these. The high of these cluster is the only cluster that's close enough for us to use this convergent point method. It's never worked for any other cluster because they're all too far away. Yes? Why do clusters form in the first place? Remember we saw a picture of the Orion Nebula last time and those newborn stars in the Orion Nebula. The galaxy has giant clouds. They're called molecular clouds. These clouds of gas and dust are unstable. Either they'll be too hot and they'll expand and disperse, or they'll be cool enough that little pieces of them will fragment and form new stars. And when that happens, this cloud might form a few dozen, a few thousand, a few hundred thousand stars, depending on the mass of the cloud and the process by which it fragments. So when these clouds form stars, you get star clusters. Now you could ask why are there molecular clouds in the first place, and that would be because there are processes in the galaxy that tend to push gas and dust together. They may stay together for a certain amount of time and then either disperse or collapse into stars, and then new clouds will form. They will collapse or disperse again. So this seems to be the way most stars form because stars have to form out of clouds of gas and dust that pre-exist the stars. And if you get one star forming, you'll probably get multiple stars forming. And how many you get just depends on how big the cloud is. All right. So the Hyades is the closest star cluster. We can do this moving cluster method for the Hyades cluster, and we get this HR diagram. All right. This is plotted in the, the absolute brightness is plotted on the vertical axis. The temperature is plotted on the horizontal axis. Unfortunately, Astronomers don't like to use temperature and brightness. They like to use other measurements that give us the temperature. So the horizontal axis is called the B minus V color. You measure how bright the star is in blue light and in visible light and do some mathematics with those measurements and you get a temperature. But B minus V is the parameter an astronomer might actually be measured. But there's a direct correlation between the B minus V number and the temperature. And there's a direct correlation between magnitudes, which are stupid units, but astronomers use them, okay, magnitudes and the true brightness of the stars. So astronomers will talk about magnitudes and say, that's a fifth magnitude star. That's a twelfth magnitude star. I don't want to talk about magnitudes in here because it just means brightnesses. But we see a lot of plots with these goofy units on it. But we have brightness plotted versus temperature. And the brightness is the absolute the intrinsic brightness of the stars in the Hyades cluster because we know their distances. When this was first done in 1910, we knew their distances were all 40 parsecs, 127 light years. When this was done more recently by the Hipparchos satellite, every star had a measured distance. They're not all at 40 parsecs. And in fact, I thought I had the numbers here. Maybe it'll show up eventually. The actual modern distance to the Hyades is 46 parsecs. But they're not all at 46 parsecs. They, some are as close as 40 and some are as close as 50. But we know the distance to each individual star in the Hyades today. So we can calculate the absolute brightness of each star without making the assumption that they're all at about the same distance. We get an HR diagram for the Hyades cluster. This is not a bunch of random stars in the sky. These are stars that are associated with each other. And we get a main sequence. And that's neat. What's that? Uh, there are squares and circles. The, and there are some triangles, if you look carefully enough. They come from different measurements. But they're all part of the Hyades cluster. The top right corner has the, the information on which telescope, which experiment made the measurements. The Hyades cluster has a main sequence. We know about main sequences. We know it's a mass sequence. We know it's a mass sequence for the stars that are living the bulk of their lifetime in this stable equilibrium, this stable balance between gravity squeezing them and the nuclear fusion reactions in the center pushing outward. The Hyades cluster has a main sequence. That's really important for us. All right. This is the Beehive Open Cluster, M44. 
So a new question for you. If we don't know the distance to a star cluster, then we don't know the true brightnesses of the stars in this cluster. But I can still put all these stars on an HR diagram. What am I going to plot when I put the stars on the HR diagram, and why is it going to work? I'm going to measure their brightness, but what brightness do I know? Apparent brightness. I don't know their true brightnesses because I don't know their distances. And if I don't know their true brightnesses, shouldn't they just scatter everywhere on an HR diagram? Why will I get an HR diagram and it's going to have a main sequence? Because they're at the same distance. Bingo. That's exactly it. They're at the same distance. The stars in this cluster are at the same distance. For the Hyades, they're spread out from 40 to 50 parsecs from 120 to 150 light years. For the more distant clusters, they're also spread out by about 30 light years. But if the cluster itself is 2,000 light years away, what's the difference between 1,990 light years and 2,010 light years? It's negligible. The difference between 40 and 50, that's 20%. But the difference between 2,000 and 2,020, who cares? They're at the same distance. So if I plot their apparent, I keep losing this. If I plot the apparent magnitudes, I'm going to get something that makes sense. So here's 47 tuck. Star cluster on the right, the HR diagram on the left. Again, we got this funny B minus B color. On the vertical axis, it says apparent visual magnitude, apparent brightness because I don't know how bright these stars are because I don't know how far away they are. But they're all at the same distance. And I get a main sequence. Every star cluster looks like this. And the reason every star cluster looks like this is they're the same distance away. And, and why do they have main sequences? Their mass. Because the mass determines where the star lands, and it's going to land on the main sequence. Physics determines that, given this mass, it has to end up with this brightness and this temperature. And every star cluster, apparently, has a distribution of masses. If every star in the Hyades had the same mass, every star would land at the same spot. But they don't land at the same spot because you get a bunch of different masses in a given star cluster. Remember, we talked about the broken Ming vase last time. You drop the vase on the ground, you get a bunch of fragments. The fragments have different sizes. When that molecular cloud fragments to make stars, when the stars are born, some of those fragments make massive stars, some make little tiny stars, some make intermediate stars like the sun. All the stars in the cluster were born from the same cloud. They were born at about the same time. And they have different masses. So you get a main sequence. Now things get interesting. Because what did we know about every star like the sun that was ever born anywhere in the universe? Same mass, so it has the same brightness, so it has the same temperature. So it lands at the same place on the HR diagram. So on the top, I've got the, the HR diagram for the Hyades cluster. And we know the distance to the Hyades cluster. So the top plot is calibrated. I know the true brightnesses of those stars. The bottom plot is not calibrated. I only know the apparent brightnesses of those stars. But I've lined these up so that the temperatures of the stars are at the same place. So there's a vertical line I drew through those two plots, which goes through B minus V about 0.8 on both plots. That means stars that intersect my vertical line have the same temperature. So the star on the main sequence, this one right here, in 47 Tuck, has the same temperature as the star on the main sequence in the Hyades, because they're both on the main sequence. And if they have the same temperature, what else do they have that's the same? Same brightness. But what I have in these funny astronomers units, it says for the Hyades, the magnitude is 9. For 47 Tuck, the magnitude is about 19. But one is absolute. One's calibrated, one's not. There are 10 magnitudes different in these funny astronomer units. 
10 magnitudes different turns out to be a factor of about 10,000. So the stars in 47 Tuck appear 10,000 times fainter than the stars in the Hyades. But they're not 10,000 times fainter. They're the same brightness. Why do they appear 10,000 times fainter? Because they're far away. From the inverse square law for light, I know that if something's twice as far away, it's four times fainter. 10 times further away, 100 times fainter. 100 times further away, 100 times 100, or 10,000 times fainter. So 47 Tuck is 100 times further away than the Hyades cluster. The Hyades is at a distance of 40 parsecs, 50, 46 parsecs, we decided. So 47 Tuck is not at 46, it's not at 460, it's at 4,600 parsecs away. I've just measured the distance to 47 Tuck by using the main sequence and using the fact that every star that's ever been born that's on the main sequence has the same brightness and the same temperature. This is an incredibly powerful tool. And it takes us out to the edge of the universe. Because every star cluster, whether that cluster is in the Milky Way galaxy or in the small Magellanic Cloud that's a companion galaxy to the Milky Way, or in Andromeda, or in any other galaxy, if I can find a star cluster and plot the HR diagram for that star cluster, I will get a main sequence. And that main sequence must be just like the one in, in the Hyades. Physics doesn't let it be any different, because the stars can't choose how bright do I want to be today. They can't do that. Physics determines their brightness. Mass determines the brightness. It's all about the mass. So I now have a technique to measure distances to anything in the universe, provided I can identify it as a star cluster and find the main sequence. Incredibly powerful technique. A parsec is 3.26 light years. So 10 parsecs is 33 light years. 100 parsecs is 330 light years. So just multiply by 3 to get light years. A parsec, well, that's what it is. It, it's units astronomers like to measure. We can talk later if you want a real definition of how we got parsecs. Here we have some other star clusters. M6, we have the HR diagram for M6 on the bottom left. We get a main sequence. We also get a scatter plot. All the dots down here, that's telling us something. It's telling us the stars that ended up there probably have nothing to do with this cluster. They're just in the same direction. But when I just look at that cluster, I can't just look at the picture and say, oh, I know which stars are in the cluster. They're all in the same direction. The way to figure out which stars are in the cluster is to actually make the HR diagram. The ones that don't fit on the main sequence and the other important parts of the HR diagram we'll talk about, they're just random stars that happen to be in that direction that aren't part of that cluster. This is the double cluster H and Chi Persei. You see the clump on the left, the clump on the right. The two of them together, you get a main sequence. It's actually a pretty nice main sequence without a lot of the scatter, because it's pretty easy to tell with this one that virtually all the stars are part of the cluster. Here's M15. Again, you get on the, the left, you get the main sequence. But in this case, you're only seeing a short, stubby main sequence. There's some other stuff going on. The other stuff that's going on, there's something on the top right. It's labeled red giants. On the left is labeled horizontal branch. And then there's something labeled the turnoff point. And that's where we want to get to, this thing called the turnoff point. If those are just the stars that are here, though, don't we have like the cluster? The cooler star, okay. in a cluster, they're all the same age. Yeah, they're all the same age. They were born at the same time. Now, same time is a relative term. Again, astronomers are a little goofy this way. So if a cluster is born, the low mass stars in the cluster have lifetimes of hundreds of billions of years. The high mass stars in the cluster might only have lifetimes of 5 or 10 million years. Those are their lifetimes. But they're all born at the same time. At any one moment when I look at the cluster, some of those stars may have died already. Some of the stars can still be alive. And, and this is the key for us in 
getting an age to the universe. But the cooler stars in that HR diagram are the stars to the left. The stars, or, yeah, stars on my, your right, my left. The stars on the right are cooler. Some of those stars that are cooler are low luminosity on the main sequence. Some of those stars on the right are very bright, and those are the giant stars. The giant stars are dying stars. I'll, I'll try to catch you up. Uh, I'll try to catch you up. Okay. Here's another one, NGC 188. We get the main sequence, and then we get where the main sequence seems to end. And that where the main sequence stops going upwards is called the turnoff point. Let me go back again. H and chi persi, it goes up pretty far. It doesn't have an obvious turnoff point, though it starts to veer up to the right. If we go all the way back to the Hyades, it's really pretty much a straight line all the way to the top because the Hyades is very young. Now remember, the most massive stars are on the top left. Most massive stars have the strongest gravity. They squeeze themselves the hardest. They need the most heat to push back against gravity because their gravity is strongest. To generate that heat to resist gravity, they've got to just go through their fusion reactions incredibly fast in order to generate that heat, which means they're very bright because if you have lots of fusion reactions going on in the core, all that energy comes out to the surface and you radiate it off from the surface and you're a bright star. But that means you're losing all that heat. So you've got to run more fusion reactions in the core to replenish the heat you're losing at the surface. But you lose the heat at the surface. So you run more fusion reactions at the core and you use up your fuel. The high mass stars use up their fuel very quickly because mass squeezes them so hard in order to, to resist gravity, they need a tremendous amount of internal heat to resist gravity, which means the fusion reactions go very fast, so they have very short lifetimes. The low mass stars, yeah, gravity's just kind of squeezing them, and they generate a few fusion reactions, and that holds off gravity, and they do a few more fusion reactions, and that holds off gravity, but they don't use their fuel very quickly. That's the difference between a Hummer and you know, a little car, right? The massive stars use their fuel quickly. They're going to die quickly. The low mass stars use their fuel slowly. They have long lifetimes. And as you go up the main sequence, the lifetimes of the stars get shorter. Yes, sir? Not in these clusters. As these stars die off, the question was, are new ones being born? There are new clusters of stars being born all the time. On average, in the Milky Way galaxy, there's about one star born per year. Okay. So if the stars are born in clusters, and a typical cluster has 100 stars, you know, this cluster might be born now, and 1,000 years from now, there's another cluster being born. But in this cluster, in the Hyades, all those stars were born at the same time. And in the Hyades, that was about 600 million years ago. Yes. All m things with mass attract all other things with mass. Why? Because all things with mass attract all other <laughs> things with mass. It's just the way the universe works. Okay? Again, as scientists, we measure what happens. We don't try to, to explain why that happens. We try to explain how it happens and what happens. And what happens is all things with mass attract all other things with mass. And the force of that attraction depends on how much mass and how far apart they are. Why? Because. Yes. So doesn't the massive star also have massive amounts of fuel compared to the smaller star? Doesn't the massive star have massive amounts of fuel compared to the, bigger, the smaller star? Absolutely. Which is why it's a massive star. But it uses its fuel much, much faster. So the massive star might have 50 times more fuel, but it uses its fuel 100,000 times faster. So it's, it still uses up its fuel much, much faster relative to its total fuel reservoir than the little one. It's a good question. All right, so the Hyades cluster still has the top of its main sequence. The 47 Tuck cluster 
does not have the top of its main sequence. Its main sequence ends right here. The stars that were further up on 47 Tuck's main sequence, there are two possibilities. One, it never had any. 47 Tuck was just born without any high mass stars. Well, there's the picture of 47 Tuck. It's got hundreds of thousands of stars. The chances that 47 Tuck was only born with little guys, pretty unlikely. Which means the big guys are gone. The more massive stars have finished their main sequence lifetime because they've used up the fuel at their cores. When they use up the fuel at their cores, they start to die. And when they start to die, they become red giants. When they become red giants, they move over to the right and upwards on the HR diagram. The, the diagram here for 47 Tuck with this subgiant branch, the red giant branch, what's labeled the asymptotic giant branch, these are all different stages in the end of life process for stars. And here we have M6. It also has the top of its main sequence truncated. And the stars move off to the right. And then you get the red giants off to the top right. The stars above the top of the main sequence that tells you the other stars have started to die. H and Chi Persei, this is a pretty young cluster. It has its main sequence all the way up to where this line goes. And then the stars that are the dots that go straight up, those are the highest mass stars that are actually just starting into the red giant phase. They haven't gotten over to the right yet because this cluster is so young. M15, its main sequence is really short. And it's got lots of stars way up to the right, and even on this thing called the horizontal branch. Most of the stars in M15, all of them except the little guys, have become red giants. NGC 188, similarly, it's a, a truncated main sequence. So if we want to find the oldest stars in the Milky Way, if I wanted to guarantee to you that I'd found an old star, where should I look? Can I just look in the sun's neighborhood and say, that guy, old. That's not going to work. How can I find a star and guarantee to you that it's old? A white dwarf isn't necessarily old. Okay? A white dwarf has gone all the way through its life cycle. But if it started as a fairly massive star, it might have died fairly quickly and left behind the white dwarf. So the evolutionary age, where the star is in its life cycle, isn't the same as the actual physical age of the star. I don't want a star that's near the end of its lifetime. I want a star that's old. How can I guarantee to you I found a star that's old? I heard bottom right. I heard outside. Tell me what place I'm going to look. I don't mean on an HR diagram. What place in the galaxy? A cluster. What kind of cluster? One without a main sequence. One with a very truncated main sequence. The open clusters, like the Pleiades, like the Hyades, their main sequences go way up. The globular clusters, they're the ones that have truncated main sequences. All right, so here's our galaxy, cartoon. This is not a picture. Okay. The galaxy is fairly flat. That's the disk of the galaxy. Uh, the sun is about 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. The whole galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. All of those globular clusters we've been talking about orbit in what's called the halo of the galaxy. They're all part of our galaxy. By measuring the distances to these clusters, we know that they're part of our galaxy, not part of other galaxies. This is the Sombrero Galaxy, M104. This is like our galaxy, but we're seeing it from the outside, and we're seeing it from the side. So it's sort of like this cartoon okay, with the flat part of the galaxy. The dark lane is because the flat part of the galaxy is filled with gas and dust, which blocks the light of the stars that's in that flat part of the galaxy. And that's where the newborn stars form. This is M101, the pinwheel galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy, just like the Milky Way, but seen from above. 
and there are lots of galaxies out there, and randomly we'll see some from the side and some from the top and some from different angles. The spiral arms are where stars are being born. This is Andromeda M31. Andromeda is the closest big galaxy to us. We think Andromeda is almost identical to the Milky Way. We're both giant spiral galaxies. M31 is about the same physical size, the same mass as our galaxy. I have no idea where M31 is. It's in the northern sky, but I don't know where M31 is. It's not in the sword, I don't think. Okay. Open clusters. No, we're not going to look in open clusters because they're too young. Okay. We're going to look in globular clusters. You answered this question. Okay. Globular clusters are where we're going to look for the old stars because they hold themselves together. Okay. So you had part of the answer in that we know that globular clusters should have old stars, but we also know that globular clusters can hold themselves together over long periods of time, whereas open clusters can't. Okay? Now, for clusters, we make a number of assumptions which are pretty good, we think. All the stars in a cluster formed at about the same time, which means they're about the same age. A cluster that is 4 million years old some of those stars are 10,000 years old and some are 4 million years old, so they're not all the same age. But a cluster that is 8 billion years old, some of those are 8 billion and 3 million years old, and some of them are 8 billion and 2 million years old. They're about the same age. Right? So to a good approximation, stars and globular clusters were born at the same time, you know, plus or minus a million years. So all the stars in a cluster are the same age. So if we can determine the age of any one star in the cluster, we've determined the age of the whole cluster. So the big question for us is, how do we determine the age of the cluster? And we're going to do that from these main sequences. And we're going to do that from the turnoff points in the main sequence. So we've talked about this before. In a single cluster, all the stars are the same age, but they're not the same mass. Stars with different masses have different lifetimes because they use their fuel at different rates because they have different strengths of gravity squeezing them. The ones that die sooner are the most massive ones. The ones on the top left of the main sequence die first. And as they die, you work your way down the HR diagonal. So we have the Pleiades cluster, and the, all the little triangles mark stars in the Pleiades cluster. The, the main sequence goes way up. In this one called the Palomar III cluster, the main sequence is very, very truncated. Okay. So I think I have, we've seen this plot a bunch of times before. I think I have sort of a cartoon for you. Okay. What astronomers will call an isochrone, isochrone means same age or same time. So what we're going to do is, from first principles, some astrophysicist is going to say, hey, this is how much mass we've got. This is how strong the gravity is. This is the rate at which the fusion reactions have to go in order to get the luminosity of the star. We're going to put that one star on an HR diagram. So there it is. And now we're going to watch what happens to that star as it ages. Well, the star is going to shine for about 10 million years. It's going to lose some light to space, lose a little mass. It'll try to cool off. It'll squeeze itself a little bit, so it'll get a little bit hotter. The nuclear reactions go a little bit faster. And we're going to do this every 10 million years. So here's what happens to that star. It's evolved off the main sequence. It's become a giant, and then a supergiant. And then it goes to this horizontal branch. And then it goes back up the asymptotic giant branch. And then it becomes a planetary nebula. And then it becomes a white dwarf. That's the evolution of a single star, all right? That's what a star will do. But we can do the same thing for an entire cluster. For a cluster, we're going to calculate the temperature and luminosity for stars of lots of different masses. And on day one, when all the stars are born, you get a main sequence. And it goes from bottom to top. And now we're going to watch the whole cluster age. And the first star that dies is going to be the top. And it's going to move off, and we're going to keep following this. And this turnoff point is going to move down as the cluster ages. Okay? So 
I can determine the age of the cluster by figuring out the temperature and the brightness of the hottest, brightest star that's still on the main sequence. That turnoff point tells me the age of the cluster. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. This is a plot of a bunch of different so-called isochrones to give you a feeling for what the whole map would look like. The, the one at the very top would be the most massive star. The next line would be a, a lower mass star, et cetera. Okay. So what astrophysicists will do is they'll observe a star cluster. You get all the data points, put them on the HR diagram, and then you fit one of these isochrones to the data. All you're really doing is you're finding the turnoff point. You're using the physics of stars, which tells you how bright and how hot a star of any given mass must be at a different age. And you find the plot that fits your cluster best. That gives you the age of the cluster. This one happens to be three and a quarter billion years old. So this is M5. It's got the main sequence. It's got a turnoff point marked TO. It's got the red giant branch, the horizontal branch. This just identifies all these pieces of an HR diagram. Here's M5 with uh, a model fit to the data. And this says 11 billion years old for M5. For 47 Tuck, 11 billion years old. For these two stars, M55 and 47 Tuck, you can look at them and tell which is older. They're plotted. It doesn't say temperature. It says this B minus V color. But that's temperature. We know that the turnoff point tells you the age. This has a turnoff point that's at about maybe 0.35. This has a turnoff point that's at about 0.45. So M55 has a turnoff point that's further to the left, which means it has brighter, hotter stars. So M55 should be a bit younger than 47 Tuck. This cluster, NGC 6397, is at a distance of 7,200 light years from us, has about 400,000 stars in it. It's the second closest globular cluster to the Earth, and it's a really old one. Okay. This is a paper from 2003 reporting ages of 6397, NGC 6752, and our friend 47 Tuck. We find that NGC 6397 and 6752 have ages of 13.9 and 13.8 billion years, plus or minus a billion years. So they have ages of between 13 and 15 billion years. 47 Tuck is probably 2.6 billion years younger, as reported in this paper. So these are the HR diagrams, and we've got some questions on how confident we can be on these ages. But the answer is, to within about a billion years, we think we're doing this right. Okay? We understand the physics of how stars work. And again, stars have no choice about what they do. Mass determines everything. Mass matters, which makes the physics really simple. <laughs> they all start with mostly helium or hydrogen. Here's where the physics could get complicated. If the star started out, if the star was born, with 80% oxygen instead of 90% hydrogen, it would be different. Okay? The composition of the star also matters. But it turns out that every star to within a percent is made of the same stuff. But in some of these diagrams, come back to this one, in some of these diagrams, the letters at the top, Z, Y, and X up there, Z, 0.02, that actually means this model, these calculations were done assuming 2% of the mass of the star is not hydrogen and helium. This star is 71% hydrogen, 27% helium, 2% other stuff. And if you change the relative amounts of stuff, you would get very slightly different model fits to the data. And that's where the answer is somewhere between 13 and 15 billion years. That's a major source of the unknown. If we knew exactly what the stars were made of, we'd be able to pin down the age a little bit better. Okay. Uh, what is the noise on the signal? 
on the on the yeah. fit to the data. The noise really comes from what we don't know perfectly. What we don't know perfectly is going to be what exactly the star is made of. Is it 71% hydrogen or 70% hydrogen? Is it 27% helium or 28% helium? That's the main source of unknowns on the fit. Another source of unknown will be how accurately we know the distance. Is it truly at 7,200 light years or 7,187 light years? That's going to add a little bit of unknowns. But the unknowns are very small compared to the real age. The age comes out for globular clusters as between 13 and 15 billion years, which is the same thing we got for the white dwarfs completely independent methods of getting an age. But the oldest white dwarfs in the Milky Way, we said, were probably about 13 billion years old. And the oldest globular clusters, about the same age. So that gives us some confidence that we're doing something right. Now, this doesn't tell us the age of the universe. This tells us the age of the oldest globular clusters and white dwarfs in our galaxy. So you've got to make some other assumptions about how long the universe was around before the Milky Way formed? How long the Milky Way is around before the oldest globular clusters and white dwarfs formed? And we can talk about those assumptions, but the assumptions are not a whole lot of time. Maybe a billion years before the first galaxies formed. And it looks like that puts an upper limit on the age of all these things and the universe of about 14 billion years. Next week, we're going to talk about the expanding universe and how we get an age for the universe from the expanding universe, the Big Bang. We're going to get the same answer, which is, again, reassuring. So that's where we're going. See you next week.